Uh, welcome to Law and Omen. <laughs> Before we forget. Yes, it's a true crime and paranormal podcast. Except for today, yes. there's very little paranormal. Basically none. <laughs> yeah, but um, you're doing like a true crime adjacent. Well, yeah. it is true crime, but I mean, it's a little bit more lighthearted and yeah, stuff. Yeah, because after you described your case to me, I was like, we need something fun to just not cry at the end of this yeah, it was really tough. I'm sure once I start talking about it, I think a lot of people are going to recognize the case mm-hmm. and the name because it got a lot of media attention. Okay. Yeah, and it's just a really sad case. Uh, like all of them are, yeah. don't get me wrong, but I think this one just hit very mm-hmm. close to home, I guess. Yeah. I think is the. Because I feel like, especially in this case, I think it's human nature, first of all, to put yourself in other people's situations and put yourself in. Mm their shoes but especially with this case Mm. like it's just very sad i had a really tough time um researching this because i researched it and then yesterday i watched a documentary Mm. on it where i got a lot of my information as well and i didn't just cry like i sobbed like it was really hectic it was sad even though this is a case that got a lot more media attention it's still a case that needs to be highlighted and it has to do with once again, like most cases, gender-based violence. Yeah. Yeah, and it's just... Ugh, it's just sad. It just really took a toll on my mental state, oh, no. I guess. Well, it's a good thing luckily, you're going away after this. I was just going to say, <laughs> luckily we're going away this weekend. I'll just have Gosh. to sit here and listen to it again when I edit. Oh, while I was typing it up, I was also getting a little bit teary again. So I'm scared oh. that I'm going to start crying while I read certain parts. And I really hope that doesn't happen. Oh, I just want to quickly go and put slippers on my feet. Good, I need to get so my wine. Cold. <laughs> okay, good. Patrick just sent me a menu for, I guess, a place that... Because I still don't know where we're going to this weekend. Okay, yeah. It's a surprise. And he's just sent me a random menu that I guess is a place close by. Ooh. And one of the milkshake flavors on the menu is pumpkin spice. And I'm like, are we going to America? Yeah. Is this basic girl headquarters? What's happening? <laughs> it's so, that's so strange. I've never seen a pumpkin spice anything in South Africa yeah, before. Thank goodness. The only pumpkin things I like are, well, I like pumpkin, but I love pumpkin fritters. I was oh. just going to say, pumpkin fritters is like the only pumpkin dessert that I know of, and yeah, I love me that. too. And pumpkin tart. I don't pumpkin think I've pie. had that. Pat's aunt makes a, uh, oh, a beautiful pumpkin pie. It's uh, so good. Oh, my, my word. My mom makes good pumpkin fritters, so that's... Ooh, she must still make me rooty. It's been like months. I was in February for my birthday. <laughs> it's like Aww. almost May. Come on, mom, get I it remember. together. You still, you still mentioned it on the podcast as well. <laughs> She's still just denying me. It's so sad. She did, though. She'd probably for, forgotten. Yeah, for Easter. But she, she gave you... Yeah, exactly. She came with a whole bunch of stuff, so... Can't complain. <laughs> no. And my dad gave me a fridge, so I can't complain. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so nice. It's so nice when they're so... Like, when you go from a smaller fridge to a massive fridge and like all the space you all of a sudden have. I can finally put that broke my Lazy Susan little thing that I got for cupboards <gasps> yes. in there. And I've got the sauces on and there's like enough space so that it's got a shelf of its own. And I can like, look, you can get your, your sauces <laughs> without even having to move your hand. Spin it. Spin it. <laughs> Where will it land? No one knows. Now I can actually get all those fridge container things like for the home yes. edits and like properly organize the fridge. Anyway, uh, maybe we should get started. Yeah, seeing as it's been a half an hour. Okay, so like I said, today's case is very difficult. It's gruesome. It's sad. And it's quite long. It's seven pages long. So if you need to get your wine, do it now. Do it now. Get some water. Um, water. She means vodka. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it's not a, it's not a nice case. I don't know how to start this. Disclaimer: the following stories contain graphic content and might not be suitable for everyone. The sources I use to find the information will be listed below, and everything I say is my own opinion unless it's stated as fact. And obviously, this goes without saying, but I mean no disrespect towards anyone I speak about. I'm merely covering the story to bring attention to it and the wider issue that is gender-based violence. Today I'm going to be covering Hannah Cornelius and Cheslin Marsh. I don't know if you've heard of no. the case before. 
So I think uh, quite a few people might be familiar with her name because this case got a lot of attention when it happened, and I think it really touched a lot of people deeply. So, Hannah Cornelius was a bright, bubbly, strong and beautiful human being, and Cheslin Marsh is a remarkably strong and kind-hearted young man, and this is their story. So firstly, I'd like to talk a little bit about Hannah and Cheslin, but I'll start off with Hannah. She was born on the 13th of February, 1996, so same year as me. Her so father... young. I know, she is... No, so I meant young. you. Oh. I feel old. <laughs> well, I'm turning 26 tomorrow. That's oh, me. That <sighs> My wrinkles are frowning at you. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess, like, age has also changed a lot in yeah. recent years. Like, 30 isn't old anymore. Yeah. Your life only begins at 30 because yeah. of... Capitalism. Oh, I was anyway. going to say because of Madonna, but yeah. <laughs> Madonna and J-Lo <laughs> and those people. <laughs> and Sho, who just never ages or dies. <laughs> like, yes. Also, the Queen is 96. She's like, yeah, I think yesterday was her birthday. Oh, yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, her birthday is in April. She's a Taurus as well. <laughs> Explains a lot. Imagine the food she gets in the, in the White House. <laughs> no, but they're British, so they eat very plain food, don't they? <laughs> fish and chips and mushy peas <laughs> <laughs> yes uh, so she was born on the 13th of February 1996 her father was a magistrate okay. and her mother was a lawyer running her own law firm I believe wow and she also had a younger brother who was diagnosed with severe autism oh. Hannah was described as sweet respectful empathetic she loved her family and she was really close with them she was really close with her parents and her grandmother as well she had good morals installed in her and she was incredibly generous Cheslin in the documentary that I mentioned um, it's called Last Blue Ride um, and it's on Showmax I don't know where else you get it but mm -hmm. I, I watched it on Showmax said that Hannah was a feminist who did not stand for the patriarchy and actually called out her friends when they displayed traces of toxic masculinity. Nice. And I, I said here, a girl after my own heart. Yeah. <laughs> um, as she grew older, she became more, I guess, sure of herself and more outspoken about things like that. Like I mentioned, she was incredibly bright. She went to Redham High School, mm -hmm. where she matriculated with six distinctions wow. and an average of about like 85%. That's really good. She decided that she was going to study at the University of Stellenbosch and that she was going to pursue a degree in the humanities department. Mm. She wanted to help people, basically. Yeah. So another example of her generosity and kindness was when she and her mom went on a backpacking trip to India and they came back around her birthday and her parents asked her what she wanted and what she wanted to do for her birthday. She said that she doesn't want anything while so many people around them have so little. Mm -hmm. So instead, she decided to make up little parcels filled with essentials and went with her gardener to pass them out in a less fortunate oh, community. Nice. Um, and apparently this was a thing that she did almost like every time she was home for her birthday. This oh, was something really that sweet. she did. She also frequently volunteered at Tears, which is an animal yes. shelter here in um, the Western Cape. Yeah. So Cheslin Marsh grew up with his mom, and he has three siblings, I believe. And he started studying social work at the University of Stellenbosch in 2016, after he took a gap year in 2015. He then switched over to theology. <laughs> theology. Mm-hmm. I was thinking of Afrikaans theology, <laughs> theology in 2017. He started studying social work because he said the community that he grew up in doesn't have many people that assist them. Yeah. And, you know, because of that, there's very little development in the community mm -hmm. itself. When he was asked why he made the switch um, from social work to theology, he said that he soon discovered that with social work, there's a rules and there's a very logical way of approaching problems mm -hmm. and situations and it was almost too impersonal for him okay he wants to help people and be more personally involved with them you know he, he mm -hmm. wants to connect with people and help people okay. um 
while being in their lives, like yeah. being an active part of their life, basically. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. He honestly seems like such a kind and gentle soul. No wonder he and Hannah would become friends. Like, it just makes yeah. sense. In Afrikaans, we say swert zuk swert, which yeah. means people who are similar drift towards each other at the yeah. end of the day. So Birds how the feather. hell did we get friends? How did we get friends? Become friends? <laughs> what do you mean? I don't know. Have you met yourself? No. <laughs> I mean, how are you friends with me? I don't know how. <laughs> Maybe I'll think about my choices. No, I'm kidding. I'm very happy with them. <laughs> don't you dare leave me. <laughs> um, so I wish I could keep talking about these two bright lights in a dark world. But unfortunately, mm-hmm. that's not why we're here. That's not why I'm covering this case. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> So the ordeal begins on the 27th of May 2017 at Stellenbosch University. Mm -hmm. So just to give a brief summary of the University of Stellenbosch, it's a really beautiful campus in a small town in the Western Cape. Stellenbosch is basically a university town. Mm -hmm. There's lots of students, many residents, and by residents I mean reses, as in um, places for students to stay. Yeah. There's many of them, as you know. I was at Stellenbosch for like a year, and then Me too. <laughs> nice. And I was in one of the reses here in Stierda. And um, basically, it's the closest thing to Greek life you will find in South Africa. Well, in Cape Town, anyway. Yeah. Um, if you were looking for like that whole sorority fraternity kind mm. of thing, Stellenbosch is where you go because that's where you're gonna get that. I hated it. Oh, I loved it so much. I, I, I so much wanted to be a hawker. <laughs> Oh, really? I don't know. My my anxiety really kicked in when I started oh, studying too. at Stellenbosch. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's what I needed one really year. Difficult. <laughs> yeah, and then too. I went on to a different college. <laughs> me too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I see why we're friends. Yeah, It's the anxiety that bounds us. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. And it's a big university. Yeah. I mean, in my first year, there were like 300 people in one of my English classes, oh, like yeah. in one of the halls. Yeah. And I don't know, it's so intimidating mm. my... Yeah, I don't have good memories about it, but I think I'm just not the right person to yeah. attend a university like that, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a great university for a lot of people and it has great credentials and stuff like that. It's yeah. one of the top universities yeah. in South Africa. It's just not for me. So, yeah, like I said, there's lots of students, a lot of resers, mm-hmm. and also a lot of other accommodation, like apartments and stuff like that. I mean, they yeah. do cater for the students that mm-hmm. live there. But I have to mention that, like many other places in South Africa, Stellenbosch has a huge juxtaposition between the affluent rich areas and the poorer communities mm-hmm. that surround the university itself. And once again, I'm not saying that all people in vulnerable and poor communities commit crimes, but when there's such a huge contrast between the haves and the have-nots, the opportunity for crime will arise. Um, If you combine that with the fact that there will be many vulnerable students walking around at night or lots of cars parked in the streets, it's a perfect recipe for crime. I mean... mean, (laughs) Sorry, what? We both have stories. <laughs> uh, my car was broken into while really? I was parked at Stellenbosch. Yeah, well, <gasps> in hindsight, it was my fault because I left a bag in my car, but they smashed open my car window. You should and... be able to leave a bag in a locked car, you know? it's Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, so... I was just going to say, I don't know how I am not a victim of anything because the amount of times I went out with like a group of friends, we walked because, you know, with the res and stuff, you walk around and walking yeah. drunk home to res by yourself at like... Yeah. two in the morning and you've got to have some like guardian angels because you know this stuff happens all the time that's and, what like, really hit me as well mm, you know to think of all the ways you put yourself into a dangerous situation and you didn't even maybe realize at the time yeah 100 percent. like literally one night at Fenster, <laughs> i went out with an ex-boyfriend of mine but before we went out obviously had pre-drinks <clears throat> and stuff and um, they lived on campus yeah. or in an apartment on campus and yeah we're pre-drinking and uh, geez, I don't have a very high tolerance for no. alcohol as it is but back then probably even less yeah. or I would say I probably still on par I just have a very very low tolerance I just didn't know it back then because yeah. I was so young and like before we even went out I was gone i should not have gone out yeah because i can't remember leaving the house oh, literally geez. Okay. then while we were out i don't even know what the argument was about but we got into an argument and 
my my boyfriend at the time, my ex now obviously, um, literally left me alone in the street during fence dash. And hell? I was drunk as a skunk walking around. I don't know how long I walked around on the streets oh and I was goodness. alone. I was completely alone. Jeez. I didn't know where he was staying because I couldn't remember. And then eventually parents were driving around. Thank oh. God it was parents yes. and it was fence dish and there were people oh. and the right people picked me up. Yeah. Um, so I got in a car and it was parents of students or whatever and I was crying. And I remember feeling so embarrassed because yeah. I was so fucking drunk. And, you know, I can't verbalize what's happening and I just told them please just take me to the police station so that at least they can just drop me at home because I can't remember where I live and um, eventually they dropped me at the police station I sat at the police station and they dropped me Hmm. at the place I don't know how I remembered it so we sat outside the apartments and my ex's friend his roommate came in Mm -hmm. and I was like oh thank god this guy is here and he let me in obviously um and then proceeded to take advantage of a situation Ugh, seriously um i don't remember everything that happened i know for a fact that we kissed but obviously i was not in a state to be able to yeah. make a decision yeah. for myself and then the next day my ex blamed me of course because I I kissed the guy. Of course. And I was like, okay, well, I was drunk out of my mind. I didn't even know where the hell I was. I literally don't even really remember yeah. if anything happened after the kiss. Or I don't remember anything of that night. Yeah. Like, it still is kind of a little bit scary. Yeah. Because obviously I don't know what happened. But yeah, so that's, I think, also why this case really, like, yeah. took me aback. Um, yeah. Because I've been literally in such a precarious situation. Yeah. I could have fucking died that night and I still don't know how I didn't, yeah. basically. Because I was a girl alone. I was 19 years old. Yeah. You know, and, and just left alone. like that. That's horrible. Yeah. Oh, and then to, to leave you alone in the night and then have the audacity to blame you. Yeah. What and I'm not dick. saying like... Obviously, like, I I shouldn't have kissed the guy, but, but you, my you fuck, you went to the police that because guy, you couldn't remember where you lived. Exactly, that guy, and that guy was stone cold sober. Yeah, he made that decision. He's a predator, basically. Yeah. So yeah, and then my ex proceeded to like harass me for <laughs> weeks after that, calling me in the middle of the night, drunk as a skunk, calling me a slut and a whore, and um, the only like I'm not used to attention because I was ugly when I was younger. And now that I get attention, uh, like I'll talk, just yeah, it's all about projecting. I was like, okay, this is great. It was wow. yeah, that was a tough time. Men be better. Anyway. So, like I said, perfect recipe for a disaster or crime. So, on the night of the 27th of May, 2017, Hannah and Cheslin went out with a group of friends. They didn't go together, but they were... Like, they were part of a larger group that went. So, like I said, this is a university town, and there are many, many clubs and bars in the town. Mm. So, they were at... There's two bars that are quite close to each other, and if you've been to Sandbosch, you know this. They were at both Bohemia and the Mystic Boer. Oh, I love those places. I think I've only been to both of them once. Yeah. Uh, So, just a note, the clubs close quite early in Stellenbosch, and they close at around 2 a.m., or something mm-hmm. like that. I think it is kind of supposed to be a precaution. I don't know, but they close quite early. Can I just ask, mm-hmm. sorry to interrupt, was this on a weekend or was this like in the week? Because I know that... That's a good point. On Wednesdays, the house I lived in, we, some of us would go to New Bar and they would let only the girls in from 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock and shots were one rand each. So oh, obviously, in the beautiful spirit of gender-based violence let all the women the young impressionable girls in where shots of one rand each get drunk out of your mind and then let the disgusting men come in at nine o'clock so they can take yeah. advantage of the women it's such a disgusting system it was a women. saturday by the way oh uh, okay saturday so shots are probably normal price then yeah. but that was that's also the sucky thing that's a wednesday night that shots are one rand each yeah. you've got class the next day yeah. you know it's like what are you doing <laughs> but there's a very big drinking culture in Mm. Stellenbosch. 
For sure. It's, it's a it's a very uh, drinking and partying. Yeah. And yeah. With our um at the house I stayed in with Yule Week, they had literally like a big I don't know how many liters tub of punch that they made. Yes. And we all had our water bottles. That was when alcohol yes. was still loud in the reds, and we had like water bottles and mugs and we were like drinking i don't know how i walked up the stairs i couldn't unlock my door even though it was unlocked so i just was lying rolling around on the floor in the passage like i don't know how to get into my room <laughs> but that's a thing like at least it was safe it's such a yes but that can create such a dangerous environment you mm-hmm. know especially yeah. when people are taken advantage of and stuff yeah. like that yeah, so um, like I said, they were at the Mystic Boor and Bohemia at around 1 a.m. Mm-hmm. So they left the bar just after 1 a.m. Mm-hmm. or around that time. And the group decided to walk around town for a bit, as yeah. you do. But then Cheslin said that he was done for the night mm-hmm. and he's tired, he's going to go home. Yeah. He didn't have a car and he was going to use his longboard that he mm-hmm. had to get home. He lived in an apartment with his mother, not too far away. Okay. So when Hannah heard that he was going to take his longboard to get home, she insisted that it was too dangerous and that she would take him in her blue and white city golf. Her grandmother had given her this car. She was a little bit obviously older. She was Mm -hmm. in her 80s or something like that. And she didn't need it anymore. Hannah wanted Mm -hmm. her grandmother's old car instead of opting for the new car that her parents offered to buy her. So That's nice. the type of yeah. person she was. So at first, Cheslin tried to argue and said that he'll be fine. He's always been protected by God. So um, what's going to be any different tonight? Then she said that if he kept on insisting on riding his longboard home, that's fine, but she would follow him behind to make sure that he makes it safely home. So she would drive behind him. So then he agreed to let her take him home, and they arrived at Cheslin's house at around 3.23 a.m. Okay. So the location is close to the battery center in Stellenbosch, and across the street there's an empty piece of land. So Hannah parked the car, switched off the engine, opened her window a tiny little bit just for some fresh air and mm-hmm. so that, you know, the windows don't fog up and stuff like that. And she and Cheslin stayed in the car a little bit just chatting probably about the night and, yeah. you know, just stuff. There was CCTV footage that was captured from a nearby shop. I don't know, maybe at the Battery World yeah. CCTV. Uh, you can see four men walking past, looking at the car at around 3.30 a.m. But they walk past and then they're out of sight for a while. At that time, there were still cars driving up and down. Mm. and There was someone um, that was either being picked up for work or dropped for work. So, yeah. you know. A few moments later, at 3.32 a.m., Vernon Vitboy, Geraldo Parsons, Eben van Niekerk, and Nashville Julius reappeared. Geraldo Parsons stuck his hand through Hannah's slightly open window, holding a screwdriver against her. Instinctively, Cheslin grabbed Geraldo Parsons' hand, but just as he did that, Vernon Vitboy opened Cheslin's door. His door was open because he was literally about to get out of the car before they were ambushed. So um, Vitboy opened his car door and told him that if he didn't sit still and comply, he would die. One of the other perpetrators also had a big knife, and according to Cheslin, that's when he thinks he and Hannah really got a big fright. You know, that type of fright that really, like, sobers you up. Yeah. Not that they were super intoxicated or anything, but, you know, they had been yeah. out that night. I think we've a lot of people have experienced that um, yes. moment where something happens and you kind of, like, get completely taken yeah. out of your drunk yeah. Duncan Hayes. It's weird how that happens. Eh? Like it's just like it your, your re- uh, survival that instincts. That adrenaline. Yeah. So the two other men, Eben van Niekerk and Nashville Julius, climbed in the back seat of Hannah's car. While this was all happening, Hannah hid the keys to a car. Okay. So she like tried to hide them away. Nashville took Cheslin's phone and forty rand in cash. <laughs> Uh, Hannah kept telling them to take everything that they wanted, but to please just leave the car because it was her grandmother's. The men started asking for the keys, and they became like almost agitated and panicked yeah. because um, they were scared that the police could show up mm. or something, you know, something like that. And allegedly, two of the four men were also high on tuck at the time mm-hmm. of the hijacking, so that could also obviously increase yeah. your paranoia. 
and your irritability and your aggression mm. and everything along with that. They became increasingly irritated, and during this time, Nashville Julius exited the Gulf uh, with Cheslin's phone and the 40 Rand, and he didn't participate in the crime any further. He walked away. They found the car keys eventually, and they started driving off with the two young students as their prisoners, basically, at 3.39 a.m. So this all happened within 15 minutes or... Something like that. So very, very quickly. At first, the men said they were basically just going to borrow the car to drive home and then they'll give it back to them. Okay, sure. Um, but their demeanor soon changed as they were driving up Halswichter. Um, it's a pass that connects Stellenbosch with the R41, Benil, um, and Franschuk. Mm-hmm. They pulled over to the side of the road and told Cheslin to get out of the car. They opened the boot of the car, where Cheslin's longboard probably must have been still lying there, and they forced him to get in there. They then continued their drive all the way back to Jamestown, which is now in the opposite direction Mm. of, like, Halswichter that they were driving up. Um, Cheslin said they stopped somewhere in Jamestown, and he heard people approaching the car. The men opened the boot and basically bragged about Cheslin being in there. (laughs) They took his shoes and his jacket uh, from him during this time as well, no doubt trying to scare and intimidate him. The men found Cheslin's wallet in his jacket pocket, and he had his bank card Mm. in there. So the men eventually, they get back into the car and they start driving again. At 4.34am, so it's already been like an hour since they've been abducted, and I, I cannot even begin to imagine how slow time must feel during that time or during those circumstances. Um, So at 4.34, they stopped at Caltex petrol station in Stellenbosch so they could go to the ATM. They asked Cheslin for his PIN number, and he gave them an incorrect Mm. PIN. Vitboy is seen on the camera in the shop where the ATM was. He tried to withdraw the money, but was obviously unsuccessful. Cheslin said that he didn't want to give them his pin because there was quite a bit of money in his Mm -hmm. account and he knew that if they did get money, because they didn't have money on them apparently at that time, Mm -hmm. or not that he knew of, and Hannah didn't have any money on her. So he knew that um, if they got money that they would buy drugs and Mm -hmm. then that would put them in serious trouble because that would make them very unpredictable, you know, and and probably more aggressive than that they already were. Yeah. Vitboy returned to the Blue and White City Golf, and they drove all the way to Cryfontaine, okay. uh, which is about 20 kilometers from that mm. particular petrol station. It's about 5 a.m. by then, <laughs> and they stop at what seems to have been like a drug dealer's den or house, whatever you want to call it, a place where a drug dealer sells yeah. his drugs from. Uh, one of the men went went inside, but quickly came back and told the other men that all of them should go in. So Cheslin is hearing all of this from the boot yeah. of the car. And one of the men asked, what about her, in reference to mm. Hannah? And the first perpetrator who said they must all go in said that she must go along with them. So they all went into the house together, and that's when Cheslin was really trying to yeah. like, break out of the boot. He was kicking the boot, but um, he was unable to open it, unfortunately. Yeah. They came back to the car, and there was complete silence. Hannah was silently complying with what she was told to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, we later found out from the boy's confession that she just kept looking in front of her. She never mm. said a word. She just kept on staring straight ahead. Yeah. They drove and eventually started driving on what felt to Cheslin like a gravel road. So at this time, they were actually near the sewage works in Cryfontaine. And at 5.30 a.m., the car came to a halt and Hannah asked them what it, well, what they're doing. And they said they were just going to smoke. But they walked around, opened the boot and said to Cheslin, you gave us the wrong pin. They took Cheslin out of the boot and walked him a few paces away from Mm -hmm. the car. And um, here's where I need to give a trigger warning for a lot of violence now. So they walk him away and they tell him to lie his head down on a brick that was on the ground. And Cheslin in this moment thinking that if he runs away now, he might get 
even more hurt. He might get in more trouble. Mm. You know, I, I'm sure he might have even thought that he, he might cause them to do something to Hannah, yeah. perhaps. You know, there's yeah. a lot of things that can be running through your mind. Yeah. Um, so he decided to comply with them and he put his head on the brick and he said he just closed his eyes and he started to pray. Mm. The men bludgeoned his head with <sighs> bricks and left him to succumb to his wounds. I also wanted to say that um, Cheslin said the last thing that he remembers seeing is just like the two men like holding a brick over their heads. Jeez. In his confession, that boy mentioned how the only time Hannah moved or looked around was when she turned around to see what they were doing to Cheslin like after they took him out of the booth and stuff. But she quickly faced forward again. Yeah. And I can't even imagine what was going through her head at that time. The men uh, got back into the car and they drove to a secluded paintball field in Botlaray Road. Trigger warning for sexual assault. Um, this is where the men took her out of the car and they raped Hannah repeatedly. And I'm not going to go into further details mm. um, out of respect for the family. They discarded the condoms they used nearby. Uh, oh, before good. Getting, Protecting themselves, yeah. are they? Assholes. Well... Yeah, later this will go into like the fact that they still had forethought yes. and they still had the idea to kind of Try not prevent to traces trace. of their yeah. DNA and stuff. So they weren't that yeah. drunk now. No, they like, weren't. They, no. Yeah, but um, so before driving away with Hannah in the boot now, at around 6.30 a.m. they headed back towards Stellenbosch and they turned onto a quiet vineyard just outside of town, and they turned into a, um, a road alongside a vineyard and a stream, and that's where they stopped the car. Oh, emotional Sorry. support, kitty. Yeah. Sorry. Um, oh, fuck. Uh, so they stopped the car, and here's another trigger warning. This is where they stabbed Hannah in the neck with mm. a screwdriver. Well, what led to it was she didn't want to get out of the boot of the car fucking obviously she yeah. held onto the car uh, onto the the sides and mm. um you know they stabbed her in the neck uh she was dragged out of the boot then and away from the vehicle she wasn't dead yeah. then uh, by this time and um the men then lifted a big rock together mm. that weighed like 38 kilograms Jeez. and they dropped it on her head twice oh my gosh so yeah, complete over. What is wrong time. with Completely them? A lot. You know, in this case, I would say rehabilitation is not something that is an option for people like that. Well, bullets to the head. That's that's. Yeah, you'll see that my view they're reoffenders. Of course, people like that. If mm. you're that sick, you're never going to change. You're just broken. And what I was just thinking, like, I highly doubt that this was their first. <laughs> oh no! Sexual assault. Their no. first murder potentially yeah. or this definitely wasn't their first crime yeah. but they were never convicted of any rapes or anything like that but I yeah, don't but believe that this was their first time because this is so over the, so violent so yeah. gruesome and so over the top that I can't think that this is yeah. someone's first time doing this and definitely I mean since you like what you said earlier that's definitely because oh I want to make people hurt more that's yeah yeah yeah, but that's also with the um, with the rape. Like it's yeah. it's not about sexual pleasure. It's yeah, about it's um, ex exerting power. It's about yeah. taking something from someone yeah. and making someone feel helpless. It's mm. it's a it's about yeah. It's, it's, like it's control. A power trip. Yeah. It's, yes. So Cheslin woke up and miraculously made his way to nearby residents' house and he begged them for help. They were very apprehensive because they thought this was gang yeah. violence, something to do with gang violence, yeah. and they didn't want to get in involved with that. Yeah. But luckily, a police van was driving by oh, just goodness. at that time um, and Cheslin could receive the medical attention that he needed. But he was very concerned about mm -hmm. Hannah and asked after her constantly and he told the police everything um, that had happened that night and pleaded with them mm. to find her. So Cheslin had big open wounds and gashes on his head and his arm had also been fractured. They later mm. had to look, they had to put a metal plate Oof. or metal rod in his arm. Yeah. And due to the severe beating, he was also left Jeez. deaf in his one ear. Not sure which one. 
Yeah, so like I said, he was pleading with police to, mm-hmm. you know, find them, find um, Hannah. Um, but unfortunately, her body was found at around 8 a.m. on the 28th of May. So the Jeez. very next morning or that morning of yeah. her death detective constable bulalane siko got the call when he was on another murder scene <laughs> on a, on another crime scene and they knew from the tire tracks in the sand where hannah's body was found that the perpetrators were still using her car yeah. so the police put out an apb for hannah's car in the hopes that they would be able to find the perpetrators in the meantime the three men continued on their fucking rampage in cryfontein a woman who was walking to work was basically chased down by the men and they, they like cat called her and intimidated her and they eventually managed to steal her handbag Jeez. and her cell phone in the handbag the men then continued to use drugs throughout the morning as they were driving along and they attacked yet another woman Jeez. in the same area They kidnapped the woman and took her to a nearby police station. CCTV captured the car um, at 12 minutes past one in the afternoon. Mm. This time, Vitboy gets out again, but he's wearing different colored pants than he was wearing on the first thing. Um, Also on that first CCTV camera um, footage, when he went in to use Cheslin's card, Mm -hmm. he was wearing Cheslin's jacket that he took from him as well. Oh, jeez. Okay. He wasn't wearing that anymore, though. He enters the shop to go to the ATM, and following not long after him is Geraldo Parsons. Mm -hmm. They withdrew 3,000 rand from the woman's bank account. Uh, they then released the woman and drove back to Stellenbosch. They released the woman um, on Botlar Road, literally not far from where they Jeez. murdered Hannah not long before that. And uh, so they gave Ibn van Nikerk a thousand rand for his help in the crimes and dropped him off. Now only two men were left in the car, Parsons and Vitboy, and they wanted to go to Delft to sell the car. So they were driving through Stellenbosch yeah. to get there. At around five minutes past two in the afternoon, Detective Constable Bulolane Siko was on the road when he spotted the car. <laughs> so he obviously started following them and um, probably radioed for backup as well. Because yeah. when the men noticed that police were following them, they accelerated and so began a high-speed car chase. Yeah. The detective, Bulolane Siko, said um, that there was a stage where he was driving plus minus 180 kilometers an hour which is so fast like our Um, our speed limit on the national highways is 120 for reference yeah yeah so it's it's very fast the men turned down into Dwarshenyberg farm in an attempt to escape Mm. but the farm is being blocked by a gate and a security guard was on standby as well so like they drove through the entrance and they Mm. wanted to get out on the other side but they closed the gate yeah um, Detective Constable Bulalane Siko exited his vehicle and gave chase on foot. When the men approached the closed gate at the other side of the farm, they pulled over onto the grass and tried to make a run for it. But Detective Bulalane Siko was hot on their heels and he fired two warning shots and he ordered them to stop. The rest of the force had been called and assisted in the arrest of okay. the two men. So Vitboy and Van Nikerk had actually grown up together in Klutusville and met Parsons because he was, um, although he was from Cryfontein, he had a girlfriend in Klutusville who he often visited. A girlfriend. Um, lucky, lucky mm-hmm. girl. <sighs> yeah. Later, one of the, yes, I was so angry. One of these guys uh, said, that he didn't want to rape Hannah because he felt guilty because he has a girlfriend and a child. Oh, it's like, wow. oh, is that why you feel guilty? Wow. But then you Fuck still you. you still helped to lift the thing that killed her. Like, cool. Oh, but he still did it. Yeah. He still did it. Mm. He felt guilty because of it. Oh. Go fuck yourself. Like, yeah. Honestly. What the hell? Just go away. Like, uh, Vitboy only attended traditional schooling up to grade 6. Um, afterwards, he started selling fruit and vegetables with his uncle. His mom didn't have the means available to care for him, and she was working extremely long hours as well. So around the age of 12, so about the same time he dropped out of school, he was sent to live with his aunt. Mm. He would complete up to grade 12 at a youth center. Mm. 
So at the time of the crime, he had two young children and he was 32 years old. Um, he had 16 criminal convictions against him from 1996 to 2016. Um, mostly for housebreaking, theft, possession of drugs, things like that. Like mm-hmm. I said, nothing like murder and rape, but how I mean, rule that out. Yeah, how many people are going to actually come forward? I mean, a lot of women feel, what's the point to even go forward? Because mm-hmm. no one's going to do anything about it. They're not going to believe you or no one's going to even investigate. So, yeah. Yeah. So, as I said, he was a reoffending criminal. So, with most people who go to prisons in South Africa, especially in the Western Cape, often join a gang in prison, which is called the Number Gang. It's a very notorious gang in in South Africa, especially, well, in the Western Cape specifically. Um, I think I am going to cover maybe an episode on the numbers gang because it is quite intricate I guess Mm -hmm. they have their own laws and rankings and stuff like that I'll I'll touch on on it but I won't go into depth I think it's it's just a lot to cover so I think um, rather doing that in a separate story would be better so he was in the numbers gang more specifically a part of the 28s Mm -hmm. Um, 28s are basically the section of the numbers gang who assault and murder and stuff like that he was ranked as a colonel in the 28s so also how you ascend the ranks is a lot of times through violence and a lot of times you ascend in prison as I understand it because you know you kind of you assault a god or you kill a god or you stab yeah so it's very it's like oh and it goes back 200 years hey the gang the numbers gang goes back 200 years that's a long time so Geraldo Parsons completed school up to grade 9, and during his time at school he was exposed to gangs and he would eventually join a gang as well, but outside of prison. He had three young children and was 29 years old when he committed the crime. So he was also a re-offending criminal and a part of the 28ths, ranking as a sergeant. Past convictions were mostly for theft and housebreaking Mm similar to Vitboy's convictions. Uh, Eben van Niekerk's parents had an alcohol problem, so he grew up around that, as well as being in a less fortunate community surrounded by poverty. He dropped out after grade 5, and around the age of 13, he would develop a drug addiction and would steal in order to feed the addiction. And I mean, your brain is not even, you're not fully developed. You're a child, and the damage that that must have done obviously not excusing anything he's done but i'm no. just saying like developmentally that must have stunted him so much there's a there's a bigger problem right yeah, there's of like course. Yeah. there's a systematic mm-hmm. problem which we need to solve in order to stop gangsterism and stuff like that we need to put a stop to poverty and put a stop to yeah it's poverty stopped. is like basically where it all yeah. st- starts because a lot of this starts because people can't make money or can't yeah get food for their family and they or it's children who are abused because of parents who have addiction issues and you know that sense of belonging that a child seeks uh, that every person seeks when they are young Mm. is what gangs prey on yeah because it gives you a sense of yes it gives you a sense of community it gives you a sense of a group that's there for you and because they do so many things together um, a lot of children who grew up in families where they were neglected due to drug abuse alcohol abuse whatever the case may be you know that it almost becomes a place of refuge yeah which is horrible that is which is and i mean poverty is also due to government being corrupt Corruption. And people yep. stealing and not giving the people yep. money, the funds, the uh, resources that they need to survive. Yep. Um, an unemployment rate is at like 35% yeah. last year. So, so many people, so many young people mm. are unemployed and don't have means of making money. Yeah. You know, they don't have... It's I mean, just... like I said, I have a three-year degree, a Bachelor of Science degree, and it took me five months to find a job. Yeah. And that's... And it's not even constant sending out cvs yeah exactly and and it's not even like it's it's um the job you're doing is what you studied to do not even not at all you're not even using your um i almost said diploma your degree now um and and that's the reality of it um then if you take into consideration that um 
uh, like the reoffense um, <laughs> statistic is like eighty five percent or something oh, like that. So bad. Yeah, because like, the prison just feeds you as a criminal. It just makes you a better criminal at the end of the day. Because of the gangsterism yeah. that's there. How 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 is there any rehabilitation mm. if these people go to prison and that's where they join the gang? Yeah, exactly. Because you have to join the gang because not have to you don't have to obviously but if you don't join a gang in prison you are a target yeah. you are at the bottom of the feeding um yeah. pool what do you say feeding whatever what is it saying uh, feeding uh, feeding what? pyramid I was you're at the bottom of the pyramid yeah food chain there we go <laughs> jeez louise yeah, yeah, you're at the bottom. <laughs> yeah. And because um, I also spoke to um, an ex gang member mm. in the documentary that I watched, and yeah, just they, they target the people that aren't yeah. in a gang. Um, they'll make you'll, you'll get the jobs like scrubbing the toilets and cleaning the bathrooms, and yeah. you know, and you're not, you're not guaranteed safety. Like yeah. the gangs kind of offer you quote unquote safety yeah. um, in, in, in the prison system. So, um, yeah, like I said, Eben would start to start stealing in order to feed his addiction. He too had been arrested previously and was a part of the 26s. So this section of the numbers gang is related to thefts. Um, and I think, yes, because like the 27s is like the mediators between the two or something okay. like that. It's very, it's very strange. Convoluted. Yeah. I didn't even. I always thought, like, I originally thought that the the twenty sixes, the twenty sevens, and the twenty nines, twenty eights, twenty eights. I mean, um, were rivals. Me too. But it's it looks like it's a the numbers is the mm. umbrella term for the gang, and then they have sections. Yeah. <sighs> So, um, Nashville Julius, which was the guy in the beginning that left mm. before everything happened, yeah. um, could not have been raised in a more opposite <laughs> environment. Uh, he had two loving parents. He completed school up to grade 11. He had one child that lived with uh, the mother, yeah. uh, while his mother also helped care for his child. He basically became involved with the wrong people and yeah. fell into drug abuse himself. Mm. And from 2006, he had seven convictions against him, similarly for possession of drugs, theft, and for housebreaking. Okay. Uh, Vernon Vitboy, like I mentioned, he confessed. Um, he did this about a day after his arrest, and in one clip from his confession that was played mm -hmm. in the documentary, he started crying, which infuriated me yeah. because as you'll come to realize, they did not have any remorse for what they did. I think they were just sad that they got caught. They were yeah. just regretting that they got caught. Yeah. Hannah's family started a GoFundMe for Cheslin to be able to afford hearing aids because mm. they wouldn't be able to buy that themselves. <sighs> he had a single mother that was raising him and his three other siblings I think two or three other siblings so enough funds were raised and he was able to get his hearing aid um, Hannah's parents also started the Hannah Cornelius Foundation and from their website okay so Anna is Hannah's mother mm -hmm. I just didn't really mention all the names yeah. because they're not like you know um, so from the website, through Anna's effort, the Hannah Cornelius Foundation was born and began its counseling and support programs in the informal settlements of Ocean View, Massey and Red Hill in the Western Cape. In just a few short months, the foundation had partnered with non-profits in the victim empowerment, child protection and youth development sectors to offer holistic, family-centered, child and youth-focused counseling and referral services. Okay. So basically, just helping the community yeah. as a whole, you know, helping prevent people from going down a path of yeah. drugs and gangsterism and mm. violence and things like yeah. that. Because I think in a lot of those communities, and not everyone in the communities, obviously, but in a lot of the communities, gangsterism and violence becomes so part of the norm, so part mm -hmm. of the mundane that it's almost, I wouldn't say accepted, but it's almost just 
it feels it's just a lot of to... light. Yeah, like what yeah. can you do about it? Yeah. So ten months after Hannah's murder, her mother went swimming in the ocean near her house, as she often did. Mm-hmm. Um, but this time she did not return. Her body was found, and her death was ruled an accidental drowning. Her husband and Hannah's father, Cornelius, said that he didn't believe that she attempted suicide, but that she just didn't have enough strength left to fight against the ocean after everything that happened, basically. Hannah's grandmother also died in the same year that Hannah was murdered. Oh no, jeez. So their trial began on the 21st of May, 2018, and all four pleaded not guilty. (sighs) Fucking punch Jackasses. Like, and I know violence begets no, violence, and no, it's never this, the answer. this but... case, bullet to the head. I'm sorry. That's my view, not the podcast view. That's my view. Because if you are that it's far so gone... It's so much more complicated. I know. No. I know, I know. No. Like, you can have sympathy for the children that they were, but I have no sympathy yeah, for no. the men that they became. Yeah. You know what I mean? No. They, they knew what they were doing. Yeah. If they knew well enough how to drive and to put on condoms and all that, they knew full well what they were doing. And it was obviously, like you said, not their first time. Yeah. They could have let them go at any time. They could have said, the two of you get out the car, we're taking the car. Yeah. So they wanted yeah. to. They wanted violence. So yeah. in this case, there's no they hope were for looking you. For, Three offenders. They were looking for a target. Um, yeah, like of when course. they were walking... Um, mm. In the streets, they were on their way to a block of flats, apparently, mm. but they were keeping an eye out for any any targets and anything, which is so scary, you know. That, just, but that's they're opportunists. Yeah. They, so a part of the defense was that they were under the influence of drugs, uh, but the judge ruled that the drugs did not affect their cognitive functioning mm-hmm. because they were still able to plan what they would do next. Yeah. Um, I mean, that boy changed his clothes, and Fannikar burned his clothes after the crime. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. They also tried to avoid cameras where they could, and also remember that they wore condoms, like you said, um, so that their DNA wouldn't be found. But they did a piss poor job of trying to fucking throw it away. So they're idiots in any case. Yeah. Not that I'm. Not that I'm no, glad no, no. that you know when I. Thank need. goodness they did that. Yeah. Exactly. So, like I said, there was no no remorse. Uh, they literally sat in court smirking and even laughing at times while testimonies were being read. I cannot explain to you the fury that I felt while I was watching some of these um, clips from the court. Yeah. Just hearing this, I'm thinking, like, I have never hated anyone yeah. in my life. Like, I feel hatred for these people. It was... Oh. I was so angry, you know, like, and I was crying, but I was angry, and yeah. I just wanted to, yeah. On the 7th of November, 2018, Judge Rossini Ali read her judgments. Vernon Vitboy and uh, Geraldo Parsons both received the following sentence. 15 years for robbery with aggravated circumstances of Cheslin Marsh. 15 years for robbery with aggravated circumstances for Hannah Cornelius. 10 years for the kidnapping of Cheslin Marsh. 10 years for the kidnapping of Hannah Cornelius, 25 years for the attempted murder of Cheslin Marsh, life imprisonment for the rape of Hannah Cornelius, life imprisonment for the murder of Hannah Cornelius, 15 years for robbery with aggravated circumstances for the woman that they um, assaulted. uh, Yeah, that was on her way to work. That woman. Um, 15 years for the robbery with aggravated circumstances for the woman that they kidnapped. And then 10 years for the kidnapping of the above-mentioned woman. Nice. Eben van Nekerk received almost the same sentence. Mm-hmm. He got 20 years for the robbery with aggravated circumstances of Cheslin Marsh. 20 years for the robbery with aggravated circumstances of, of Hannah Cornelius. 10 years for the kidnapping of Cheslin Marsh, 10 years for the kidnapping of Hannah Cornelius, 25 years for the attempted murder of Cheslin Marsh. Why, why is it not here? I'm, I'm sure he was also sentenced for her rape okay. with the same life imprisonment. Good. And, and her murder as yeah. well. I think I might have just not written it down, but yeah. I, I believe it was the same. Yeah. 
<sighs> okay, so now I'm going to say something that's going to piss everyone off <sighs> because it pissed me off. After 25 years, all three men will be eligible to apply for the parole process. Uh, of course. How? How do you give someone that many sentences and then say, oh, but there's a minimum amount you can serve? How? What is the point? Then you might as well have just said, just go. Just leave now. There's no point. Obviously, this doesn't mean that they'll get parole, but... I hope they die in prison. Job Mornay Haram, sir, got out recently. Of course. You know what I mean? So the parole board has failed us before. Yeah. Oh, my word. (sighs) So I was... I was... Once again, I was fucking irate when I heard, read that. Like, what is the point? Like, yeah, you can't... Then, then all those are just pretty words. Yes, you can't give justice with one hand and then take it out of that hand with the other hand. What is the point? I hope that judge gets fired. The thing is, I think that's just how our law works, how the prison system works, unfortunately. Well, then our president should be fired. Any all of them. The whole cabinet. Things. Like, because yeah. that is ridiculous. What is the point? You're not protecting anybody. There's no point. You're There's just no sending point. them in for 25 years to get training on how to come out and do worse. Yeah. Um, <sighs> Nashville Julius, uh, the guy who left before everything ha- well, yeah. things really started happening, received 15 years for robbery with aggravated circumstances of Cheslin Marsh, 15 years for the robbery with aggravated circumstances of Hannah Cornelius to run concurrently with the previous sentence, 7 years for the kidnapping of Cheslin Marsh, Seven years for the kidnapping of Hannah Cornelius to run concurrently with the previous sentence. Altogether, he was sentenced to 22 years imprisonment, and he's considered a good case for rehabilitation. Mm-hmm. That's if you actually do rehabilitation, yeah. which they don't in prison. Yeah. So I because then it's also like once again pretty words. Yeah, because it's also like sure he left earlier, but if he was put in the situation, would he have taken part? Mm. So you can't even give him a pass because he left. You know? He's not going to get rehabilitation, though. No, he's gonna he's become literally going to go to the worse. prison where, where gangsterism is Law. the norm. Yeah. Exactly. Law. Exactly. Um, so when the sentences were read out, the gallery exploded in cheers, obviously, because it is a win, I yeah. guess. It's not really, but, you know, nothing's going to change yeah. what happened. The defendants were still seen smiling, and, um, like, some of them were even showing, like, Shop shop, like thumbs up. I want to cut off every single one of those fingers. I've never been more angry. Like I regret doing this podcast so much right now. (laughs) I know, I know. I'm so angry. I was, I was sweating last night. I was so angry. Like, and I was sitting on the couch. I was just sweating because I was angry. I was working myself up so much, and I was crying. So I was sweating and crying. (laughs) Oh gosh, you're dehydrated today. (laughs) Yeah. Very. <laughs> so the parents of both Cheslin Marsh and Hannah Cornelius both gave very emotional victim impact statements. Yeah. Uh, Hannah's father said, It is my belief that our family died with Hannah, and it was buried when my wife walked into the ocean a short time later and did not return. Me and my son are no longer family. We are survivors living in the ruins of what was once a family. Oh, that is so tragic. Like, I just got goosebumps reading that again. Uh, yeah, because, like, three generations of women, like, were gone out of that yeah. family so quickly. Within a year. And yeah. you can't say, like, that emotional toll didn't push that grandmother to that point. It's, that's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. Because they were so close as well. Yeah. And as a mother, to know um, that your child went through that, that guilt you must feel, even though you don't have you shouldn't. But, yeah. So those men so, killed three women, in my opinion. And destroyed yeah. the lives of those two men. Yeah. Well, three men, including um, the other victims, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Cheslin, yeah. Yes. So, um, Hannah's brother doesn't fully comprehend the concept of death. <sighs> um, like I mentioned before, he is severely autistic. Mm. And um, when his father made a statement um, for like a year and a half, and who knows, it might still be going on. But for a year and a half, he, um, the brother, would, every night before bed, he'd stop by ha- um, Hannah's, like, framed picture, and um, he would ask his dad, like, when is Hannah coming back from a holiday? Oh, no. It should be over now. When is she coming back? <sighs> that is so heartbreaking. So, and how, it, as a father... And the dad has to relive yeah, that every, every time. single day. Yeah. 
exactly what I was going to say. So Hannah's father also stepped down from his position as a magistrate because he said that he didn't believe that he would be able to remain impartial yeah. um, in future similar cases. Cheslin dropped out of university after this terrible ordeal, but he returned to his studies in 2020 hmm. and he and his fiance had a baby that year Aww. as well. Hannah's family were very outspoken that she was no more special than any other victims of hmm. crimes um, and that the amount of media attention her case received wasn't fair because what had happened to Hannah happens to women and children every day in South Africa they were basically still like that just shows you who this family is you know what their morals are who they are as people that Mm. even through this even though they are the victims in this case the indirect victims of this case they still fight for that equality because let's face it Hannah was a very beautiful white young lady Mm. you know and i think that they recognize that so many other people from less fortunate communities and especially people of color don't get this type of publicity all the time and they go through exactly the same things you know how many how many stories oh i don't even know how many stories i can cover that you know run in the same vein as this and yeah so that's the end of this tragic case um the Hannah Cornelius Foundation is still up and running and I'll definitely send you the link um, and yeah. then we can add it to the post if, yes. if anyone is willing to donate or just mm. wants to check it out. I don't know. Maybe they have, I don't know if they do volunteering or yeah. something like that, you know. Mm. Um, and yeah, like I said, there's nothing that I can say that will make this better. As a family friend of Hannah, of the family said, you can't say, oh, well, at least they didn't suffer or at least... Uh, she's at peace now or whatever no. because it still doesn't change or rectify anything she you did know, suffer <laughs> she's that too but she's still gone you know even though she's not suffering anymore yeah. she's still gone no. you can't say anything you can't say oh well thank goodness they've you know been yeah. sent to prison and there's just there's less justice because she's gone yeah and because it's senseless. every day a woman or ch- a woman and children in south africa are in harm's way yeah because of gender-based violence yeah. it is a fucking pandemic yeah driving past um the hospital to go to dance the other day i saw the signboard for like the rape crisis for example yeah the fact that we have to have something like a rape cent- rape crisis center a specific place where women can go because it happens so often we need a special place for it that is such yeah. bullshit yeah like we have to have like a special charity shop to raise money for it it's its own separate section that should not be the case no. It should not be that prevalent that it has its own freaking wing in a hospital. I really shouldn't. It really, really shouldn't. Men, be better. And if you yeah. know a oh, quote man who is someone who assaults women, you have my full permission to go beat the hell out of them. No. <laughs> there is that um, that Indian metal band that I like um, called Bloody yes. Wood, and that song I sent you, Dana Dun, which is basically them singing, so good. if words are not going to change these men just go and beat the hell out of them because we have to stand up for women and we have to fight it's not every man for himself it's every man for every woman like you know we've got to like stand up because if you see someone being shady as hell call them out for it let people around them know yeah like maybe you can stop that cycle as a man as well if you want to say not all men then you need to hold other men accountable because that's what Mm -hmm. i've noticed the most is that men don't hold other men accountable mm-hmm. for for things that they do or yeah. say or whatever and it, it, and it can be as small as you know oh, do you know what i fucking hate it's when people tell rape joke or when men, oh, I men hate tell, tell rape jokes i hate it so much, especially when they're playing that video games fucking funny. or whatever oh, i'm just saying it it's just like a joke it's not a joke it's like not that a is joke. it happens every fucking single day. Yes, it's a Go joke away. until it happens to someone you love. Then exactly. then suddenly it's not a joke. Then it's suddenly exactly. not okay. Don't make jokes about stuff like that. Why would you jo- What is funny about that situation is what I would like to know. Yeah. It's funny to them because they're not going to be the victim of that situation. If they were women, exactly. they wouldn't be making that joke. Exactly. And you can't say it's dark humor because it's only dark humor when you when it's something about you and that you've experienced. Mm-hmm. Then it's dark humor. Yeah. But you can't 
say it's dark humor when you're talking about when your man talking about raping a woman that's reality that's not humor yeah it's not funny it's not a joke and it just shows not, how like sad you are as a person because you show no yeah. respect for any other human beings exactly as nice it's as a person as you might think you are sense of humor yeah it's yeah if that's funny. your level of humor then you need to seriously like i don't know go to a comedy show see or a therapist or something. Yeah, that too because <laughs> yeah. you've got problems <laughs> yeah Oh, I'm so angry now. I hate this. Can we stop doing I this know. podcast forever? <laughs> I know. And it was such a long case as well. And <sighs> like I said, like I understand that there's a, a deeper issue, that it's a that it's an issue with systematic yeah. poverty and but... drug abuse and gangsterism okay. and, 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 You still and, have a choice as a But person. that does not take away, exactly, that does not take away your responsibility yeah. and your cognitive ability as an adult to make yeah. decisions. Yeah. I understand that, you know, trauma shapes a person yes. and trauma changes a person. But, like, a lot of people go through similar experiences and yeah. don't turn out that yeah. way. Yeah. And again, like you said earlier, if they had the cognizance to know how to drive, know to wear condoms and try to clean up the mm-hmm. evidence, they were aware enough to know what they were doing. It was premeditated. They were looking for secluded spots to go do what they wanted to do. Exactly. They were looking, they were on the prowl when they yeah. were walking around yeah. on the street at that time of the, the mm. morning anyway. And they proved that by going after those other two women afterwards. Yes, so exactly. They were still... just on a fucking... Yeah terrorist free mm. you've still got hannah's blood on you call it. and you're going after two other victims but then you and fucking say oh, i'm innocent yeah oh, fuck yourself man oh like at least if you're gonna be that much of a shit stain of a human at least admit it and take responsibility and say yeah i plead guilty yeah. you know at the very least if you have no respect for the family at least have the decency to do that but not sit there oh i'm yeah. innocent and then laugh amongst yourselves exactly oh it's just oh why <sighs> anyway um what <laughs> what did you do <laughs> sorry i literally just exited the whole tab i was like i'm fucking done with this Thank, Goodbye. Thank goodness I'm downloading the recording this time. Because right? imagine oh if we had to sit through that again. <laughs> no, I would just quit. Yeah. Oh, my, oh, my word. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I Break? Just, yeah, please. I need to get wine. I think I need two glasses at this point. Yeah, I need to take a breath. Yeah. I'm going to go, like, punch a pillow or something. <laughs> oh, fuck. I'm going to go punch our punching bag. Oh, I should get one of those. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, Lily! I've got my emotional support Pomeranian. I was gonna say, Lily is here. <laughs> Alright. Oh, emotional support kitty! <laughs> Thank goodness we have these. Yeah. Lord. All right, so we took a bit of a turn from my usual stories because Chanel warned me about her story and I was like, okay, we need something that's going to distract us. And I'm very glad that I went this route because I need the distraction right now because yeah, I'm so I angry. Oh, okay, so I got uh, just a few. I think there's like maybe 12 little stories here of the dumbest just criminal. Just a few, 12. No, they're shorts. <laughs> I know, no, no, I know. <laughs> <laughs> the dumbest criminals. The stories I can okay. find. Cool. Oh, some of these. Oh my word. Okay. <clears throat> so, I would argue that all criminals are dumb. But yeah, but one of, especially one of these on here, I'm just like two. Like, oh, you know what? They're all dumb. <laughs> <laughs> just to have some wine first. <laughs> all right. So, in Glasgow, Scotland, a man tried to rob bookmakers a few years ago. A man named Gary Ruff held up a cucumber covered in a black sock and threatened a female worker of Ladbrokes in Shettleston. He demanded cash, and this woman obviously refused, because, like, you're holding up a cucumber yep. in a sock. Was, like, this is I not a gun. Saying, you can, I can see that's a cucumber. <laughs> I'm just picturing a cucumber in an ankle sock with all of it sticking out. <laughs> 
<laughs> Not even a big sock. It's just an ankle sock. Uh, a secret sock. Yes. Even worse. Just the top is in. Oh, those annoying ones oh. that every step you take, it just goes under your foot. Yeah. <laughs> but this cucumber is also holding pistols. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, Mr. Ruff, also that surname. <laughs> I know. Mr. Ruff was then tackled to the ground by an off-duty police officer and was arrested. So at first he told the police it was a, quote, joke, obviously. Mm. And then he oh. said, quote... Also not funny. Yeah. And then he said, quote, am I getting the jail for this? How do Scottish... The jail? People... Yeah, exactly. How do Scottish people... Am I... Am I... Am I getting the jail for this? No, that's Irish, isn't it? That's how... Irish. How do Scottish people sound? <sighs> Scottish. Scottish. Um... So Scottish. Uh, I'm thinking my dad read a porno. <laughs> About Spooner. Spooner. <laughs> Hello. Spooner. Hello. My name's Spooner. Am I getting the jail for this? No, it's, it's terrible. <laughs> anyway, so yes, he was jailed at Glasgow High Court in 2014 after admitting assault with oh intent to rob. Not that long ago. I thought this was like in the old time. Old timey fucking. Yeah. <laughs> What's happened in my matric Jeez. <laughs> and of course, this is something that a Florida man would do. In 2016, uh. Mac Yearwood from Florida was wanted in connection with an assault. So what does Mac do? He uses the wanted poster as his Facebook profile picture. A friend even commented, quote, nice mugshot. And Mac replied with, thanks, buddy. So naturally, he was tracked down via his Facebook and was arrested. So the what Stewart Police Department went on to write on their Facebook, quote, Facebook is a great way to communicate and connect with old friends and family. If you are wanted by the police, it's probably not a good idea to use the, quote, wanted of the week poster of yourself as your profile pic, end quote. Like, yeah. Oh, stupid, stupid man. What the hell? And then there's a story, I don't know where this happened, but two aspiring criminals who had the genius idea to rob an ATM machine with a blowtorch. So they managed to melt through the heavy metal frame, but they also burnt all the cash. (laughs) (laughs) I was just thinking, how long is it going to take, though, to to blowtorch open an ATM? I mean, they, they got through, but then by the time they got through, they're like, oh... The, ma- the money's all, like, destroyed. No more money because yeah. we've burnt it all. So then probably the most embarrassing story is of James Allen from Ebingdon, Oxfordshire. In 2012, James tried to rob a news agent. There is CCTV footage of him taking off his balaclava, and he also fell over a drinks display. <laughs> he struggled He struggled to escape because he was pushing the door instead of pulling it, to the point that the woman he was trying to rob... With a toy gun. Help him. She came to help him open the door. So he he had tried to rob the same shop like 10 days before as well. So he was sent to prison for three years for attempted robbery and two years for possessions of a firearm or imitation firearm. And one extra year because he's stupid. (laughs) And I love that there's CCTV footage of this. So you can search James Allen (gasps) and see the video footage of him being an idiot. (laughs) Oh gosh, I can't wait. I'm going to look that up. A Chicago resident, an 18-year-old named Ruben Zarate, tried to rob a muffler shop. They informed him that the money was in a safe, so he resigned himself to the fact that he wouldn't get to the cash then. So what did he do? He left them his phone number, you know, so they could let him know when to come back and rob the safe. (laughs) What the fuck? No. I am speechless. How do you... It just keeps getting worse. In Germany, a 29-year-old man tried to break into his neighbor's flat by using his bank card. You know, like they do in movies and TV shows. So he tried to, like, jimmy the lock with a card. Why don't you just rip off that black piece of, like, thing on the Oh, yeah, the tape, yeah. That magnetic strip or whatever. But the noise he made woke up the flat's (laughs) owner. And in this guy's hurry to get away, the card snapped in half. The half of the card... So he left... That the neighbor found had his name on it. Oh my god! So gosh. this guy calls the cops, and they came and they searched the thief's apartment, and they found the other half of the card on the kitchen table. <laughs> he just left it there because he didn't. 
<laughs> what did he think? That, did he think he was going to get the other half back and glue it back I together? Like, you can just well throw away that piece now, man. Yeah, like, I, I love... This. I love the... F- yeah, I said it was stolen or something, but I love the fact that the part with his name yeah. is the part that broke yeah. off in the apartment. That's wonderful. <laughs> and the most Australian story ever. A thief reached into the window of a parked car and he grabbed a tote bag out of this car. What he didn't know is that the bag and the car belonged to a professional oh. snake catcher, Brad yes, McDonald. Yes, I thought so. And oh inside the bag was a highly venomous snake that McDonald had just captured from an underground car park in Sydney. <laughs> like wonderful I hope that snake bit him <laughs> you know decides to rob Steve Owen's fucking car yeah, exactly and there was even one from South Africa on there in Joburg a, pol- <laughs> a policeman was responding to a burglary report so he sat down on the couch so he could take a statement the homeowner looked down and saw the burglar lying on his stomach like flat on the floor half under the couch and half like behind it the Guy's head was like right where the policeman's legs were. So the police like got up and, and like, quickly police... arrested him. Yeah. Um, How did and... the police not notice that when he was sitting down? I, I don't know if it's like the angle that the couch was okay. when they walked into the room. Because it's like saying that when the homeowner looked down, then he saw. Oh, okay, then he um, saw it. Yeah. Um, so then the policeman got up, arrested this burglar, and then he had to hand back the stolen jewelry and camera. And, you know, I assume he was taken in. Everything is still there, yeah. Yeah. So. Well, that's great for the yes, homeowner. Because yeah. you get everything back. For sure. So. But, oh um, my to just hide under it, a couch. Couldn't even leave in the, yeah, I couldn't even leave the premises. Oh my gosh. <laughs> So then, police had released information regarding a recent break-in in Canada. They received a phone call from a man who called the police to clarify exactly what had been stolen, as the police had released incorrect information. So this, of course, made it easy for the police to follow up on him and to use his call as a confession to arrest him. <laughs> oh my gosh. In the United States, a genius named Jonathan Parker from West Virginia broke into a house. Before he left, he logged onto his Facebook account and didn't log out. What a fucking idiot. So the police could track him down really easily. Like, before he left, he did the crime, whatever. Before he left, he logged into Facebook. Can't miss the updates on the feed. Of course, yeah. <laughs> Just robbed a house, lol. Like, what the hell? <laughs> what are you doing? Was this, was this also, like, was this still a year where Facebook was uh, a mm-hmm. thing? Yeah. Uh, Just like, Jonathan Parker is feeling felonious. I don't know. Like, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> then, the worst Father's Day gift. A 10-year-old named Brian Klein. That was my microphone being stolen by my thighs. Okay. <laughs> then move the cable. There was a 10-year-old named Brian Klein who found his dad's old handcuffs. His dad used to be a security agent. On Father's Day, little Brian jokingly cuffed himself to his father, William Klein Jr., who's 33. So they laughed, whatever. William phoned the police because they didn't know where the key was. That's when it stopped being funny, of course, you know. Yeah. Um, William phoned the police in Des Moines, Iowa, and, you know, everyone laughed as they freed the pair from the handcuffs. But as is standard practice, the cops ran his name and discovered oh. two warrants for arrest that were outstanding. Oh. So minutes later, the police were at William's house, arresting him for real. <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, how bad my son feel. I wonder what the warrants of arrest was for. I really wish I, I wonder could. If it's, imagine if it was something stupid like a parking, like an outstanding yes. parking ticket or oh, speeding oh. fine or something like that. Yeah. Oh, that's oh. on Father's Day. That's so bad. And the last one. This happened in Ossining, New York. A 23-year-old named Black Lead. That's wrong. Black Lead. Blake. Sorry. <laughs> it's like, why can't I read? <laughs> why is he called a plug? Basically. <laughs> Black Lead. I can't read. There we go. Um, a 23-year-old Blake Lead was trying to break into a mini mart. Two policemen chased him down, and they fell or took a tumble or something. I don't know how these cops fell over. But while the cops were trying to get back to their feet, Leek used the moment of confusion to find a place to hide. He took refuge on the grounds of a big building. Problem is, that building was the infamous Sing Sing Maximum Security Prison, (laughs) where where he was caught by a guard. And I searched, I searched to try and find records to see if he got sentenced, what happened. I couldn't find anything. So, yeah, I was just like, of all the places, that's like worse than Alcatraz. Like, (laughs) to 
We've got a Sing Sing to hide from the cops. What an idiot. <gasps> oh, that is so great. So, yeah. That, that oh, was that was a amazing. nice reprieve. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> needed that. Yeah. <sighs> oh, it's just really nice. And I mean, there's lots of stories like this. There's so many sites with like eight top dumb criminals or 23 stupidest criminals or whatever. So if you need a laugh, just search it on Google. And of course, the, the links will be in the show notes. Yeah. It is like, I, I'm glad that, you know, we can talk about these things yeah. in, a, in a sense. And even if it's like, even if just one person hasn't heard of this case and, yeah. you know, it, it kind of brings attention to you. Yeah. Yeah, the problems mm. in South Africa. Mm? Because how many cases have I already covered where women are the victims, you know, yeah. and it's a, a GBV case? Yeah. And there's so many more, like, it's, there's so yeah. many cases, like, I'll basically just, I'll never run out, which is, so I wish I would run out, you yeah. know what I mean? I'm, I wish I would rather run out of stories to cover, yeah. but yeah. in South Africa, that's not possible and it's like i said with the the rape crisis thing the fact that we have a term for the amount of violence there is against women that's just ridiculous Mm -hmm. like that we have gender-based violence everyone knows what we're talking about like that's sad like that there's a whole term for it there shouldn't be you know yeah we should just be able to live in peace but no because we are women apparently like we don't deserve the same peace or the same rights yeah okay that's nice. <sighs> I'll say it again. Men be better. <sighs> yeah, it's just. Oh, now I'm angry all over again. Now I have to read those stories again. You know what? I'm gonna eat my KFC, drink wine, and I think watch the Kardashians. <laughs> and then do my diamond painting. <laughs> I hope you enjoy that. I have to fucking clean. <laughs> I cook, but I'm just gonna put pizza in the oven and call nice. it a day. Yeah. Yeah. It's the easiest. Put the pizza in the cup. Co- in the cupboard. Oh my god. <laughs> Some witchy, it's some witchy pizza. <laughs> Never mind, you know, ignore me. What would be on the pizza? Eye of Newt. Sage. Oh. <laughs> we are very different people. <laughs> we, we practice things differently. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> okay, so now we have to start a pizza shop called The Coven. <laughs> like, we have to... <laughs> The Coven Oven. Yes. The Covenant. (laughs) (laughs) Again, we ended with food. What? It doesn't happen on purpose. It just... It just... I didn't... It's just what our interests are. Yeah. And also, I'm just hungry, so (laughs) that's probably it. (laughs) I'm also hungry. Yeah. Shame. I am just seeing this is already two and... Two hours and 15 minutes. Um, Yeah. So for your sake, I think we should say goodbye. I know. Time to Um, say goodbye. (laughs) Sorry. (sighs) Yes. Um, Thank you for listening. (laughs) Yeah, thank you for listening. We post a new episode every Sunday. Mm -hmm. Um, One day when we can do this permanently, we'll do more episodes. Yes. During the weeks and stuff like that. Aren't you looking forward to that? (laughs) Oh, that is the like I would the love dream. to be able to yeah. just you know basically cover stories and true crime yeah every day and bring more light to it and post more on yeah. social media and be just more active but because we both have full time jobs mm-hmm. and you have you were running a business on the side mm-hmm. as well I'm studying on the side yeah it's a lot it's just not feasible <laughs> right now <laughs> but yeah we post every Sunday we don't have a time we post no. Last week was the first week I posted early. I felt so amazing. proud of myself. Yeah, I was so proud too. Uh, I was like, wow, yeah. what happened? Eight o'clock and it's up. <laughs> Jeez. Um, yeah, so if you have any listener tales or mm-hmm. any cases that you hope uh, or want us to cover, mm-hmm. uh, please pop us an email to yep. info at lawnomen.com. Yep, you can also now submit through our site. There is a contact yep. us on the homepage. So you can send us any queries, questions, whatever stories suggestions um, yeah yeah and the page um our website is just lawnomen.com mm-hmm. right yeah yeah and uh we're on instagram and facebook mm-hmm. and 
We have a Twitter and we have a TikTok and we have a Reddit. That Reddit. I don't know how to use yet. And <laughs> we have. Um, I'm sure we have other things as well. Probably. Um, if not, I'll you can probably find join it. it. <laughs> yeah, and it will be at Law and Omen. Because yeah, no one luckily, else. Luckily, all used of it. our. Um, mm-hmm. Exactly. I was just about to so say. Luckily, luckily, our name is quite unique. Okay, it's time. <laughs> it's time to leave. Time to say, say goodbye. goodbye. <laughs> hey, at least you're in the party spirit now for your weekend. <laughs> yeah. You can go practice your singing while you scrub the toilet. <laughs> uh. <sighs> hey, goodbye, Kristen. Oh, I love you. Goodbye, I love you. Bye. <laughs> love you, everyone. Bye. Bye.